They were the largest beasts to ever walk the earth. So large, they dwarfed the great T-Rex. When they vanished, they left behind a few big bones, a huge digging problem, and a tall tale about the biggest of them all, the one that got away. In the uplands of northern Patagonia, in Argentina, earthquakes are not unknown. But once there was a time when something else made the ground shake and the earth move. Rodolfo Correa is looking for a creature that dwarfed giants. A paleontologist working in Buenos Aires, Correa packed up and moved to the town of Plaza Huincal after the discovery of a single bone, a very big bone. The local people always come to me with things that they have found. They are usually nothing, but sometimes, just sometimes, they are really excited. I have seen cases when the local farmer break to me in a plastic bag, bag uh, uh, just one dinosaur, almost complete, and uh, paleontologists were nothing to do with that, just a local farmer. A farmer named Guillermo Heredia was out walking one day in 1988 when he stumbled across it. He says, I was tending the farm when I saw something white that caught my attention. It looked round, like a ball. I tried to move it. It seemed to be the end of a bone, so I began to clear the earth from around it. I realized that I had found the leg bone of a skeleton. I was really surprised, and I took it to the museum. And that's it. What more can I say? I found something of really great value. For Korea, it was the find of a lifetime. Argentinosaurus wincalensis, named for the town where it was found, lived more than 66 million years ago, near the end of the Cretaceous period. It was a colossus in a family of giants. They're called sauropods, lizardfoot, four-legged plant eaters with long necks and long tails. The biggest were the size of 30 elephants. They were the largest animals to ever walk the earth. Korea is the first paleontologist to unearth Argentinosaurus. In every sense, his find is big, and digging it up raises big problems. About six yards from the first discovery, Korea noticed the outline of a rib bone on the ground. 
Since rib bones are connected to backbones, Korea figured that somewhere underground there might be a vertebra. From the first bone he found, Korea calculated how large Argentinosaurus must have been. Working back down, he estimated the size of a vertebra, then began to excavate. To avoid hitting the fossil, he dug a hole three times as large. If Korea is lucky, this will be the twelfth bone he's found. Signs of still more lie scattered around, more plentiful than the time and money to dig them up. This rock might contain a bone, or a fragment, or nothing at all. After three days of digging, Rodolfo Correa hits paleo pay dirt. We have found part of the bone that we have inside the block. If we consider the position of the rib, of the mold of the rib that we have here, um, the vertebrate, if it is a dorsal vertebrate, is showing in this direction with the posterior pulse part of it over here and the anterior part of the vertebrate and the dorsal part of the, of the vertebrate over there. A human vertebra is only three inches high. A single backbone of Argentinosaurus is 20 times bigger, five feet tall. Korea estimates the entire beast was 130 feet long and 80 feet high. So far, Korea has dug up seven vertebrae. In all, Argentinosaurus had about 50 or 60. Unlike any other dinosaur, the vertebrae of Argentinosaurus interlock in a rigid spine. Flexibility was sacrificed for strength to support such a long neck and tail. Perhaps a stiff backbone is the key to the beast's great size. The digging is over, but Korea's work has just begun. He now has a three-ton mystery on his hands. Once back in his lab, he'll begin to carefully chip away at the rock in hopes of finding another piece of the Earthshaker Argentinosaurus. puzzle that took a few days to uncover may take a few months to unlock. While Korea pieces together Argentinosaurus one bone at a time, another paleontologist is truly looking at the big picture. Bob Bonker wants to show the world just how big big is. To do that, he's going to great lengths. Sauropod dinosaurs are the most gigantic biological machines ever to have walked the Earth. They're stupendous. What we're going to do with this ladder and the building behind me is go to grips with stupendousness. What does it mean? How did they deal with it? How did they solve its problems?
zoologist McNeil Alexander of the University of Leeds in England is also studying the size of the supergiants, but he's taking another approach. To determine just how heavy the sauropods were, he's conducting an unusual experiment. We've only got bones of fossil dinosaurs, so there's no point weighing them, but we can work out how, real, how heavy real dinosaurs were uh, by using models. This model sauropod is 50 times smaller than the real thing. By dunking it and measuring the amount of water displaced, Alexander can calculate the weight of the beast itself. He estimates Argentinosaurus weighed between 80 and 100 tons, with the potential to be a whole lot bigger. If you're going to be big, you need thick legs to support your weight. And if you look at modern animals, uh, a gazelle has thin legs, an elephant has thick legs. Make this animal's legs thicker, and eventually they're going to touch. That limit would probably be reached uh, when this beast got to about 400 tons. A 400-ton animal would be about the size of a 747, yet Argentinosaurus reached only one-fourth that size. Something kept it from getting bigger. Nature. The larger the animal, the more land it needs. A creature that got too big would eat its way into extinction. The land that supports millions of ants won't support even one elephant. And that means that wherever you find two elephants in Africa, you might have been able to fit in a giant sauropod. From the start, a creature's size is limited by the size of its egg. If a chicken were as big as a sauropod, it would lay an egg the size of a Volkswagen. Yet sauropods laid eggs about the size of a soccer ball. Sauropod eggs are about the size of this football. So how big a baby can you get in that? Imagine uh, this chap here, fold his tail round, curl his neck round to the size, you could just about get him into an egg this size. The egg shell itself limited size. Too big, and the egg might collapse under its own weight. Too thick, and the baby might not escape. If Argentinosaurus started off no bigger than a soccer ball, how long did it take to reach the size of a barn? Neil Alexander believes that by age five, a supergiant would have been no bigger than a German shepherd. By 15, no bigger than a horse. Argentinosaurus, he says, didn't mature until age 50 or so. Bob Bakker disagrees. This is a baby super, super, super sauropod. Three months old, weighed 300 pounds. Now he had to grow up 
from this size to this 15 years old, full adult size, 80 tons. Maximum growth spurt, one ton a month. We know they grew that fast because if you cut these bones and look at them under the microscope, they have an open, fast growth texture. What isn't disputed is why sauropods got so big. There are all sorts of advantages in being big. One is uh, that you're pretty safe. If you're bigger than the predators, they're going to be a bit scared of you. Another advantage in being big, if you're a plant-eating animal like this, is that you can reach high in the trees where other animals couldn't reach. A Brachiosaurus, he's twice as tall as an adult giraffe. So he can reach really high and eat leaves that no, no other animal can get at. No other animal could put away food like a sauropod. Just how much it ate would depend on whether it was warm-blooded or cold. If this animal was uh, cold-blooded, it's going to have to eat about half a ton of food a day. If he was warm-blooded, metabolism going ever so much faster, it's going to have to eat five or ten tons a day. Now, think of that little head chomping away, five or ten tons of food going in. The food's just going to have to go down that gullet at a fantastic rate. I, I don't think it's possible. Now, this is the head of a, a giant sauropod. This is an intake hose for vegetation. No chewing, just breaking it off, swallowing it 22, 24 hours a day. And this is built like a 80,000-pound bird intake hose, a hot-blooded hose. I think of sauropod dinosaurs as uh, very much the, uh, the equivalent of the big herbivores of the present time. I elephants and giraffes and so on. Moving around, usually quite slowly, nothing to be afraid of because they're so big, spending most of their time eating. Quite a dull life, really. If you were a, a sauropod, particularly if you were a parent or a newborn, your life would be exciting and light-footed because sauropods weren't big, clunky, solid critters. From the chest right up to the tip of their head, they were full of air. Their whole front end was like a giant turkey neck, very quick moving and light. And the hind legs had more strength per pound than any living hippo or rhino or elephant. So don't think of a sauropod as an oversized elephant. Think of it as a tremendous turkey. Elephant or turkey, sauropods had a neck like a giraffe only longer and a long way for blood to travel. The neck of Argentinosaurus was 12 feet in length, two to three times longer than a giraffe's. So how did its heart pump blood to such a distant brain? Some experts believe sauropods evolved smaller brains or bigger hearts. The pressure involved is twice the pressure needed to drives blood uh, round a giraffe. I'd be tempted to say that these animals simply couldn't have uh, pumped uh, blood around with uh, normal sorts of hearts. If I hadn't seen a giraffe, I'd tell you that giraffes were physiologically impossible. If these animals had huge brains like a giraffe, there is no way they could pump enough blood up into their head. But they don't have huge brains. They had brains as small as a cocktail weenie. Pea-brained or big-hearted, Argentinosaurus can at least lay claim to one indisputable title. It's the largest dinosaur ever found. Or is it? Somewhere under the landscape of Garden Park, Colorado, may lie a set of record-breaking bones.
Dr. Kenneth Carpenter of the Denver Museum of Natural History is on the trail of a dinosaur and a legend, a giant to dwarf all giants. In 1878, paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope discovered a bone three to four feet long and 143 million years old in the sediments of Garden Park near Colorado Springs. It was a badly damaged vertebra from the trunk, just in front of the hips. Cope named the creature Amphicelius fragilimus. This one bone, if it had been complete, would have been over eight and a half feet tall. This one bone indicates a dinosaur that was easily in excess of 150 to 170 feet in length. It probably weighed in excess of 100 tons, and it was certainly the largest dinosaur that we yet know, larger than Ultrasaurus or Seismosaurus. And I'm hoping to find more of this animal somewhere in this vicinity. To fund his digs, Cope sold many of his fossils to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, somewhere in transit between Colorado and Manhattan. The only piece of Amphicelius was lost. To this day, it hasn't turned up. The Earthshaker Amphicelius survives only in the imagination. If we could have Amphicelius walking down a street in Denver right now, that would be a wonderful sight. It could rear up and look through a fourth or fifth or sixth story window. Back in its native habitat, though, that was an elegant animal, moved smoothly, gracefully, in great groups, picking and choosing the most delectable parts of the vegetation. Wandering out here, I would find, finally, more of the Amphicelius. I don't know, I, part of me would be very excited finding more of uh, this giant animal and to finally resolve and prove one way or the other the actual size. And, but on the other hand, part of me would be, I don't know, somewhat reluctant on spending the rest of my life excavating the thing simply because it's so damn big. Wow, even I'm amazed. That's the most magnificent animal that has ever lived. Painting a supergiant is a labor of love. So is digging one up. Rodolfo Correa is devoting his career to putting Argentinosaurus back together. One day, I can to make a complete reconstruction of Argentinosaurus. In this way, I will show everybody how this incredible and huge and amazing beast look like. I don't think that I have enough life for finish the work. I trust in my students, even my daughter or grandsons. Amphicelius may yet turn up, or perhaps it never lived at all. Perhaps bigger specimens may yet emerge from the twilight of the Cretaceous. If they could walk our streets, they would find them overcrowded. Our world could not accommodate the mightiest animals to ever stride the land, the Earthshakers.